Welcome to the Random Encounter Show. I'm Dev Stalker 5. In this episode, we're going to begin our descent into a very deep delve into one of my favorite tabletop role-playing games of all times. None other than Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls. If you've never heard of Tunnels and Trolls, uh, even though it has such a long history, I can't blame you. It's sort of off the beaten path. But Tunnels and Trolls is a role-playing game rule system unlike anything else that I've ran across on the market. It puts the story and the role-playing well ahead of the rule mechanics. It's very fast playing and it's so easy to work with at the table. Uh, now, why am I calling this a deep delve? I want to make a very comprehensive video guide for deluxe tunnels and trolls and really just tunnels and trolls in general. And I want to break it up into a few episodes. I don't know if we're going to be doing three or four. Time will tell when we get toward the end of this thing to see where we can wrap it all up and put everything together that we're going to present. Uh, so in this episode, I want to focus more on like a general talk overview of Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls. And that's going in, into the, the game's long history. Uh, things I really like about the game. The community I found dealing with Tunnels and Trolls. And some misconceptions and misleading things people often put out there. And then just really just dive off into what I think makes this a brilliant role-playing game system. In the future episodes, we're going to take a look at products that's been, been made available for Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls and older stuff as well that I find very useful, including those famous solo modules, you know, the Solitaire Adventure modules that are one of the big claims of, fames, uh, claims of fame to this system. But we're also going to take a deep dive off into the Deluxe Rulebook and break down the rules and the rule mechanics and see how they work. And then I want to do a wrap up of how it's all put together, how it all goes together and how you can really unlock the potential of this game because I've seen people using this system and stuff and while you can do anything you want on your table, a lot of people approach Tunnels and Trolls like they would Dungeons and Dragons or other class and level systems and I think that that doesn't allow Tunnels and Trolls to really shine for what it is. Uh, now before we get off deep into this, I want to thank all of our subscribers here at the Random Encounter Show. I can't believe how fast we're growing. Uh, so from the bottom of my heart, you have all of my appreciation. Thanks for being part of our community. If you want to really join into the community at a, at a deeper level, we've got the Random Encounter Army on Facebook. Uh, I'll put a link below. It's a fantastic, it's a small group right now. We're growing that as well. But it's a place for you to come share your table and your hobby. And I love the fact that I've been able to answer questions people have asked me and give advice and recommendations and just make friends and, and have people to talk to about the hobby. So, hey, it's an open invitation. Come get involved. Now, let's get, let's get to business here with Tunnels and Trolls. And I can think of no better place to st start with this than how I got into Tunnels and Trolls. Yeah? We have to rewind the clock back only to 2015 for me. Uh, you guys know I look at a lot of systems. Well, maybe you don't know, but if you've paid attention to the show and, and checked out some systems I'm into... I don't play a lot of mainstream systems. I have nothing against them. I have just found my true hidden gems and treasures off the beaten path. And in 2015, I was looking for a more abstract system, I guess you would say, or a more role-playing, something that put role-playing in the story first kind of system. Uh, I didn't want another version of RuneQuest or Rollmaster or D&D &D and its associated clones. So, 
I got on the hunt. And in that hunt, I came across an article talking about deluxe tunnels and trolls going to Kickstarter that, that a new modern edition of this game was coming back. And I got very excited because in all my life, I had never seen tunnels and trolls in a game store or none of my friends or gaming groups and stuff talked about it or owned it. But I had seen advertisements for tunnels and trolls throughout the years in 80s and 90s gaming magazines. And I had also read a few small pieces included when I've read books that were just around the role playing hobby in general. Many of them mentioned tunnels and trolls. And they also mentioned the solitaire RPG modules for it. And so, I, you know, the dim light went off in my head. There's a game I remember. That's a name I remember. I love games that have old school roots. They tend to be more hobby centric versus commercially centric in approach. Uh, that's important to me. So I went and I started researching tunnels and trolls. Uh, at that time, there was very little comprehensive, uh, very little comprehensive coverage of tunnels and trolls. Uh, most of the articles and videos and stuff were just sort of generalized terms, but nothing really in depth that would tell me what I needed to know about the system. So I continued searching and I found the, the Deluxe Tunnels and Troll Kickstarter page. The Kickstarter at this time, this was, this would have been in October mid late October and the Kickstarter had come and went and it was available from Flying Buffalo Incorporated. I went to Flying Buffalo Incorporated and they had it available uh, around 60 bucks for this for this hardcover uh, rule set and they had three solo adventures that had been published under the deluxe edition. I went ahead and grabbed those things and I was a little bit worried because 60 bucks was, is still, and was then, a really expensive rule book for a role playing game. Especially for something where you didn't really know what to expect. <laughs> so I, I really just bought it off of just a blind purchase hoping for the best. I said Tunnels and Trolls has been around for a long time. There must be something to it. I've got to check it out. And one of the things, I know you're supposed to never judge a book by the cover, but one of the things that really drew me to this system, got my attention, was this beautiful Liz Danforth artwork on the cover, and even the back cover. There's Bjorn, he's a famous wizard uh, in the city of Kosht in Troll World. We'll get into that stuff later. But it was this cover. Uh, so I purchased it. Waited a couple of uh, days. It came in the mail, and when I received my package and opened it, and looked at this hardcover rule book, the book nerd in me was highly impressed. Okay, that's that's where my real nerddom is. I collect uh, antiquarian books and such. I've got a whole nother. I've got a building outside that, that houses my collection of books, and a, oddities and curiosities and antiquities and stuff I've picked up in my travels and over time. One day I'll take you out there and let you check it out. But yeah, big book nerd. Uh, it was the attention of detail that this book had. Uh, probably the highest quality role-playing game book. Uh, this is a standard issue that I've ever purchased. Uh, the attention to detail is amazing. The thick cover boards. Okay, I'm getting a little book nerdy, but look at those. Look at those end papers. They are the end papers to the book are are maps of Troll World. You know, so, sewn binding on board. Come on. Okay, enough of the book nerd me. Uh, anyways, back to the story. Very impressed. I sat down and I read this book cover to cover. And I probably did it two or three times. Uh, that's how I learn an RPG system. Uh, I'll share a video on how I do that at some point. It may be helpful for people. But that's normally what I do is I'll read, I want, a over, I want a good understanding of the mechanics of the rule system and how they all relate to each other, the different systems, combat, magic, character creation. But I also want a general atmosphere, uh, an idea of the atmosphere of the game itself. And they packed everything you can imagine into this uh, single volume uh, tome, is what I would call it, close to 400 pages. 
It's amazing. I mean, every all the rules you would ever need for this game, plus more. Then you get a full you get a full campaign guide in here, an atlas with maps and histories and stuff of Ken St. Andre's Troll World, and uh, and it's also been contributed to by, by many people over time. And this is sort of a collection of his works and those contributions in whole. And it even comes with a large three-part game master adventure and a small solo adventure and stuff. Just an amazing product, okay? Uh, but I got this out and I was simply amazed. Now I set those solo adventure modules to the side. We'll get to those in a little while. But I set those to the side and I put myself through character creation with this. I, I, I rolled up a few characters and then I took them out in my style of solo gaming into Troll World and just messed about. And it didn't take me very long to see some of the brilliant innovations uh, that were in this game. And I knew immediately this was the game I was looking for, for the more abstract side, more story-driven, role-playing game side of the, not role-playing game, role-playing aspect of the game side that I wanted for my library. Yeah? So I had fallen fully into the cult of Tunnels and Trolls. We talked about that in the episode, made a joke about it, but that's really what it felt like. And that comes from the fact that once I had got into Tunnels and Trolls, I was hooked. So I joined a few small Tunnels and Troll groups on uh, Facebook. And when I got into those groups, I was simply amazed at what I saw. Even though they were small in number, these were some highly devoted, highly passionate Tunnels and Troll gamers and fans. Not only, not only that, uh, a lot of people involved with Tunnels and Trolls. Ken St. Andre, Rick Loomis, uh, Steve Crompton, Liz Danforth, Deborah Kerr, a lot of people that were directly involved throughout time with Tunnels and Trolls, they were in these groups. They were sharing stuff. They were answering questions. They were asking questions. Uh, go find that in a large D&D group or something. It was amazing to me. And the whole community around it and how knowledgeable they were and how much they would share and how much they personally contributed themselves to the game. Like I said, simply amazing. I don't know what to equate it to, but I couldn't believe it. It was like a secret society of the RPG world. An underground club or something. <laughs> I don't know. It was the, the feeling I got from it would be like, if, if you had a house for 10 years and you decided you wanted to renovate this house and you knocked a hole into one of the walls, you're going to do something with a wall and you, you knocked a small hole through and you looked through and you saw that there was a room on the other side of this wall that you didn't know about. So you continue and bust a wall down and you go into this room and it's beautifully furnished, but you look around and realize this just isn't a room. This is a whole secret house that I never knew about in my own home. Not only that, you open the door to go outside the room into the rest of the house. It was full of people that you just got along with very well. You know, it's like, where have you been? <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. it. It was the community. It was the fact that the game had been around so long and I had never gotten involved with it. You know, it just all those factors built up that I was just highly impressed in, with my entrance into everything Tunnels and Trolls. Uh, talking about that long history of Tunnels and Trolls. Uh, 1975, Ken St. Andre authored and created, developed, and then published through Flying Buffalo Incorporated the first edition of Tunnels and Trolls. And that would make it the second role-playing game published known to human civilization. Yeah, that's quite a little claim to fame there. Uh, there's quite a few claims to fame with that. And uh, lucky for us, we've had several people involved with Tunnels and Trolls on the show. Got to interview and talk with them and such. Ken St. Andre, the troll godfather himself, came on the show and he actually talked about what motivated him, motivated him and inspired him to create this wonderful role-playing game system. And the things he say, said... I find perfectly valid. Uh, briefly, it, he went to a game night and 
picked up a copy of the original iteration of Dungeons and Dragons. And I don't know a lot of you if you've seen it. Uh, there's a lot of veteran gamers on the channel, so some of you have. You'll know what we're talking about. The rules were very badly organized. They were very vague and somewhat incoherent. And there was large chunks of the rules that were missing. Why? Because Dungeons and Dragons had just evolved from uh, miniature wargaming, uh, in particular chainmail fantasy wargame. And a lot of the rules, such as for combat and such, players were meant to pull those from that war game. Too bad if you didn't know that. And the rules in the book were written in a way that was specifically for war gaming. Like movement, it talked about inches, you know, because it was talking about miniatures on a tabletop. I don't know. It was vague. It, it just didn't come together. And, and Ken said that he loved the idea of having a fantasy world in which players create characters and they go on adventures and live inside this fantasy world. He just hated the way it was presented. And I can, I can understand that. He also didn't like the polyhedral set of dice, you know. Now, I can relate to that too, but nowhere near on his level. In the 80s and 90s, a full polyhedral set of dice, typically for Dungeons and Dragons. That was a rarity then. They were precious to us. We could get our hands on them, but not easily. So I can only imagine in 1975, before Dungeons and Dragons had really taken off and anybody really knew anything about it, how hard it would have been to find that those those full set of polyhedral dice, you know? So I find, yeah, I agree with Ken. And at that time, a lot of people sort of took it like Ken did. Now, most people went down the route that they took what was written and they just house ruled the missing stuff in and cleared up things that they didn't understand in their own ways for their own tables. Yeah, Ken wasn't happy doing that, apparently. He sat down and he created his very own role playing game that did not share much in common with Dungeons and Dragons whatsoever. And, I don't know, I've got to know Ken over the years, I follow Ken, uh, I go walking with the Troll Godfather almost every day. A few of you in here know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I've got to know Ken a little bit. And Ken's a retired librarian. He's obviously very familiar with classic mythology, Classic fantasy, modern fantasy, sci-fi, even westerns I've seen. You know, those are my three top categories for literature and, and uh, fiction. From novels and movies to TV shows. I love them. And, but, but Ken also has this wild sense of humor, a good dose of being whimsical, and a little splash of the gonzo. And... That's like the imperfect ingredients for somebody who's wanting to set about creating a role-playing game rule system for the tabletop. It truly is. And in most of all Ken's works that I have read, all of those qualities pour forth through his words. I absolutely love it. Uh, so, but Tunnels and Trolls came about. Now the next claim to fame for Tunnels and Trolls would be that Rick Loomis, he's the head of Flying Buffalo Incorporated, the publisher of Tunnels and Trolls and various other games and stuff. Uh, he come up with the idea and they published Buffalo Castle, 1976. And they combined the choose-your-own-adventure style small novels, I guess. With you, you, you go from paragraph to paragraph making decisions. They combined it and wrote with a with an RPG and they and they wrote it for the Tunnels and Trolls rules. And that was also a first of its kind. Before then, there were options for solo play and such, but it nobody had done the choose your own adventure style using a role playing game system. Uh, so that was a first, and it's often been imitated, you know, throughout the history of role playing games. We've seen all the big games create those style adventures. We've seen some things like fighting fantasy and fabled lands and lone wolf and stuff, they also seem to, you know, were obviously inspired by this idea as well. They just included a 
game mechanics with RPG elements in their game books instead of having written them for a separate system. So, and Tunnels and Trolls would continue to go on. Uh, it has been through many editions, okay? Now, one thing I love about role-playing games, if they pull it off, is simply what Tunnels and Trolls has pulled off for 47 years now. Make sure that whatever edition you're coming out with is compatible, or at least easily compatible, with what you've written before. And Ken St. Andre, he took the advice that if it's not broke, don't fix it. That means all of Tunnels and Trolls, everything written for it, no matter what edition, under what rule set, everything is easily compatible with each other. Uh, a very smart way to grow Tunnels and Trolls. Of course, it went through editions. Those editions allowed Tunnels and Trolls to grow and expand. Okay, without changing the core mechanics of how the game is played. Uh, throughout the years, there's been many editions of Tunnels and Trolls. I think technically here in the United States, there have been... The uh, Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls would be considered the 8th edition. I know in France it is considered the ninth edition. And because of the worldwide distribution of Tunnels and Trolls, wherever you live, it might be whatever edition. But technically, we're just going to say it's the eighth here in the United States. <laughs> and that was another aspect of Tunnels and Trolls we didn't even talk about yet. Was that it was a very widespread game. To be off the beaten path, at least in compared to like Dungeons and Dragons, it got a really widespread release. There's French versions of the books. There's German versions of the books. Uh, what surprised me most was Tunnels and Trolls is very big in Japan. More so than... It, in, in, in Japan, this is more of a mainstream tabletop game. Uh, Ken came on... I'm not Ken. Steve Crompton came on. And we looked at some of his Tunnels and Trolls collection. And he had a lot of the Japanese books and magazines and stuff. It was really celebrated in Japan. And it continues to be very popular there. And it was the first game to reach its shores. So, uh, but I know that I've met players in the Tunnels and Troll groups from all over the world. So it, it got a good distribution, for sure. Uh, it got, uh, there's Tunnels and Trolls here in America. It had the Sorcerer's Apprentice magazine. And I believe another magazine from Trollhalla. Ken or Steve, if there, when you guys watch this, you might clarify some things I say in the comments, okay? <laughs> Uh, there's computer games made for Tunnels and Trolls. Raiders of Kazan is one of those games. Uh, and, and just novels and, and all kinds of stuff that Tunnels and Trolls has that just, when I finally got involved, I couldn't believe how much there was, and I never came across it. Uh, but, you know, getting involved in 2015, I got in on the tail end. Now, from there, from, from what we talked about toward where we are now, a few instrumental things surrounding Tunnels and Trolls has happened. In 2019, we sadly lost Rick Loomis, the head, uh, creator and head of Flying Buffalo Incorporated, who was the publisher of Tunnels and Trolls and Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls, along with some sister games to it. Uh, so, the... Flying Buffalo was sort of shook up. I, I wasn't, I'm not involved with it personally, you know, but uh, with, with Rick passing, things sort of got shook up with, the, with, with Flying Buffalo Incorporated. And I like to talk about Rick Loomis because I've spoken to him a few times. Unfortunately, I didn't get to know him as well as I would have liked. But we've had people on the show, uh, Deborah Kerr, Steve Crompton, Ken St. Andre, and hope, hopefully we'll get many more that were involved. I have to say that Rick Loomis was a pioneer of the tabletop gaming industry who doesn't get near enough credit than he actually deserves. So he just, just a fantastic guy who had an eye for talent. When he passed away, this was in 2019, Steve Crompton took over Flying Buffalo Incorporated as an acting manager. Okay? 
Steve did a fantastic job. I'm not sure how he pulls off everything that he does. Ken says he's the hardest working man in the role playing game industry. Uh, I tend to agree. <laughs> Steve, if you ever get to talk to Steve, just ask him what he's got going on at even any given time and your head will spin. But he took over Flying Buffalo Incorporated and he didn't just run it. He continued to make sure new products were coming out and to support old products and he kept up with the web page. It, it, was, it was a Herculean task to say the least. And Steve did a fantastic job. And it was through Steve that I've got to know more and more and more about Tunnels and Trolls and his history and meet other people as well. Uh, but he took it over. And technically, it was the estate of Rick Loomis. Uh, like I said, I'm not personally involved and I don't have any just first-hand knowledge. I was just a player and a friend watching from afar. And last year, 2021, a company came forward to buy Flying Buffalo Incorporated. They wanted the, the big company. Their name was Web Sphere. Okay. Uh, they came forward and they wanted to buy Flying Buffalo Incorporated. But, but one of the conditions that they were going to buy this thing was, was that they would acquire the rights for tunnels and trolls. And... Like I said, I'm not involved personally. I don't know the story here. But I think it reflects highly upon Ken St. Andre's character as a human being. Okay? Because he agreed to, to uh, let Tunnels and Trolls, at least the rights to Tunnels and Trolls, go to this new company. And I sat there and I really thought about this. And what a just... Beyond good person Ken St. Andre must be, uh, the troll godfather, you know, that he knew that it was important for the, for the sale to go through for Rick's family and such, and he took what is essentially his baby. The man created this game, maintained this game, loved this game, and stayed devoted to this game and its fans for 47 years through some good times and through long periods of what would be considered rough times for most role-playing game systems. He stuck through it, but he was willing to do that. So I don't know a lot of people who would do such a thing. So my hat is completely off to Ken St. Andre. What a fantastic, beautiful human being. Okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Anyways, anyways, WebSphere now owns the rights to Tunnels and Trolls, and they've been selling off what they uh, got from the Warehouse of Flying Buffalo Incorporated. We talked about that in a video I did with some warehouse finds of Tunnels and Trolls. Uh, so far to this date, no one knows what the exact future for Tunnels and Trolls actually is. WebSphere themselves, they have not come forth and said, this is our plan, or get ready for new content or anything whatsoever really that I have heard. And normally I'll hear rumors or whispers of things, but we really haven't heard anything from them. And I don't believe that they're, they bought the rights to this game and Flying Buffalo Incorporated and such, that they're not going to do something with it. Time will tell. I'm just, at the time of this recording in, in, in 2022, we haven't heard anything. So, It'll be something to look forward to in the future. Now, Ken St. Andre has moved along. And he he's made one of the sister games of Tunnels and Trolls his successor to this game, uh, Monsters, Monsters. We'll get into that when we cover the uh, a lot of the products and stuff for Tunnels and Trolls in the next episode of this deep delve. So that's, that's, that's just some important stuff to know, but it gives you an idea of the history and the importance of Tunnels and Trolls itself. Now, with Tunnels and Trolls, of course, in over time and through articles and videos and stuff you'll read, one of it, the probably the most famous aspect is the solitaire choose your own adventures. Lots and lots and lots of those have been published. We're going to take a look at a great many of them in the upcoming episode. Uh, but starting with Flying Buffalo in 1976, uh, and Flying Buffalo continued to publish. 
but other publishers got into it as well, such as Judges Guild in the 80s. Uh, there was even some bootleg publishers that are still putting stuff out for Tunnels and Trolls. But I don't know exactly how many solo adventures were published over time. I have seen various lists that all differ from each other, and there is a whole lot of solo content created for this game itself. But I feel like that solo adventure content that's created for this game oftentimes overshadows the brilliance of this rule system. And it also leads to some misleading things that you're going to hear repeated over and over and over here on YouTube and in articles and such written about tunnels and trolls. So I, f I feel like it's important to clean these misconceptions up, this misleading uh, stuff that's put out there and repeat it over and over. Uh, that way you, if you're interested in this and whatsoever, you'll know more what to expect. Uh, the first thing to clear up is you'll hear this misconception in three or four different flavors, but you'll hear it as that Tunnels and Trolls was the first solo RPG. You'll hear that Tunnels and Trolls was the original solo RPG. You'll hear the fact that Tunnels and Trolls is a solo RPG. And the answer to that is no. On all accounts, it's just no. Uh, Tunnels and Trolls, every edition, the rules are written for the traditional group play, a game master and players. Now, of course, you can play it solo. You can do that with any role-playing game system. But it's not written as a solo RPG. It never has been. Okay? That comes from the fact that the solo adventure modules written for the rule set, notice for the rule set, are oftentimes overshadow the rule set itself when people talk about this game. The second thing you will hear about this game is that it has simple rules and it's very easy for beginners. And we can agree and disagree on this right here. But here's my take on it. Uh, in the modern sense of the word, when you say an RPG has simple rules, normally we're talking about games that aren't full role-playing games. Things like Four Against Darkness, for example. Uh, deluxe Tunnels and Trolls, and all Tunnels and Trolls rule sets, really, they are full role-playing games. They have full character creation, magic, uh, combat rules. They have... Uh, they, it, everything that you want out of a full role-playing game system for traditional play and solo play is available in Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls and the additions before it. So I don't consider it a simple rule set. It, 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 people, people always confuse, and we talked about this before, they confuse the level of detail with a level of complexity for role-playing games. And it's just not, it's just not a proper way of seeing it. Tunnels and Trolls is a very abstract rule system, but we should not confuse it with being just a simple role-playing game. And it's that abstractness of the game that when you say it's easy for beginners, that's yes and no to me. Okay? Because this game is abstract, it's given you all the rules you're going to need, and it talks about how to put them together and stuff, but for a true beginner, there's some massive gaps there due to the abstractness of the game. Uh, the more abstract, the larger the gaps are from the rule mechanics. These rule mechanics do not make this game go forward. You know, when you see more detailed systems, you know, you can roll dice and move the game forward. That's not going to be something you're going to want to try with this game. Okay? Uh, it's going to take... A great deal of imagination, storytelling, creativity, and problem solving to get this game running on the table. Not because of the rules. It's brilliant. You know, if you understand how to use an abstract system, you can use it to great advantage. Okay, but if you, you approach this like you would Dungeons and Dragons or something, you're going to be sort of lost in the sauce there. And we're going to get into that, how to put this game together in, the, in, this, in this series. But a true beginner, those gaps 
it would just be hard to wrap your mind around what you're supposed to be doing with all this. And But I will say, okay, that is also it is easy for beginners in a lot of ways. If there's a veteran at the game table, either game mastering, offering advice as a player, t uh, explaining things, whatever. If there's a veteran of the tabletop gaming at the table, uh, it's going to be a very... I find it a very easy game to teach. In fact, I've been using Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls over the last several years to as my go-to system to introduce new players, whether online or in person, to the concept of role-playing games on the table. Uh, but the reason I bring this up and the reason I say they, it's this misleading is because I try to sit back and I put myself in the shoes of a cold start new beginner to role-playing games. You know, maybe I'm a person out there and I've heard about role-playing games and I've I've always been interested in them. I love fantasy movies or video games or whatever. And I've always wanted to know about these. And I've been doing some research and I found out, hey, you can you don't need the whole group and everything to play these games. You can actually play them solo. And I came across Tunnels and Trolls, Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls, whatever. And I decided to look at this game. And just about everywhere I went to, I, I saw it being called a solo RPG of some sort. Or I, and I've seen it, this, a lot of people say it's simple and easy for beginners. If I went off that advice and I bought this rule book, I would be sorely disappointed. <laughs> I mean, I would be. Because... It's not an easy game to grasp due to its abstract nature again, and it's also written for group play. Yeah? Now, that doesn't mean it's not great for so solo gaming in the various styles of solo gaming. It is. It's fantastic. But from somebody who's not knowing what's really going on, a solo game for beginners, this is not. Yeah? Now, you can make the argument that if you bought this book as a cold start beginner, and you grab some of the solo adventure modules, such as what we got here, Treasures of the Mummy Queen. Okay, this is one of the last ones printed by Flying Buffalo Incorporated. If you bought this rule book just to play those solo adventures, you would be fine. Why? Because those solo adventures fill in the gaps. Okay, uh, it takes the place of a game master. Uh, you know, so it does fill in them gaps. But I would also say that if you only want to play the solo adventures, you don't need this full rule book. You have absolutely no need of it. There's a there's several products out there. I'll show them in the next episode, such as the Japan Adventures product, but also several solos that have quick start solo rules, but they'll be all you need to play the solitaire adventures. Okay, so... With those sort of common misconceptions out of the way, let's move into Tunnels and Trolls itself, into what, how I use this game and what I, what I find that I really love about this game. First off, the game itself is abstract. We keep saying that. I want to drive that point home, okay? Uh, in fact, it is the best abstract rule system I have ever come across, and it takes its place in... One of my, uh, one of my three families of core role-playing games. Okay, uh, I find this extremely useful for group play and group play at the table and online. Due to its abstract nature, uh, with this game as it's written, the story is well in front of the rule mechanics. The, the, the rules themselves are very easy to learn and remember. This is not a role-playing game where you're going to need to be referencing the book often or looking at charts or a lot of this other stuff that goes along with more detailed systems. Uh, once you get an understanding for the mechanics here and the rules themselves, it's a very fast-paced game. Uh, things like combat. Instead of having individual characters roll for initiative and make moves and then commit to actions and have this whole thing going on, it, no, it's much more abstract. You take, uh, you, take the, you take your characters 
and you look at their attributes, which are very important for this game, and you'll come up with some modifications and how many dice they should roll. All the characters on one side roll against all the characters on the other side, and you compare the numbers. The higher number wins the combat, and the difference from the lower number is the damage done to the opposing side. Then you'll add in some spike damage. Okay, we'll get into that when we look at the rule system more in detail and talk about these rule mechanics. But I just wanted to talk about combat as an example of the abstract nature of this game. Very fast-paced. Uh, with that, I have seen some negative comments on Tunnels and Trolls. And it normally comes from people coming from class and level systems trying to play this like a class and level system. And I think it just loses so much value and potential as a rule set to use it in that manner. Of course, again, it's your table. Do what you want, you know? <laughs> but I think, I think trying to use it like a class and level system, you miss out on a lot. Uh, but with combat, I've seen somebody said the combat so cut and dry. One side versus the other, you roll dice until one side dies. Uh, again, the abstract nature of the game catches people off guard. Uh, who's going to stand there and just, you know, your character, you're just going to stand there and fight back and forth head on. Where's the problem solving? Where's the creativity? Where are you thinking? Hey, there's saving rolls and stuff in this game for a reason. You don't have to just stand there and fight head to head with your enemies every single combat. Use your noggins. You can, you can create traps. You can do unexpected things. Okay? Because this game's only limited by your imagination. This is a big game if you're very creative and imaginative. This game is going to be fantastic for you. Okay, but like I said, rule mechanics come in second place to the storytelling and role-playing aspects of this game. Uh, for you guys out there that love role-playing, you know, this is a game that's going to be killer. Uh, if you like me, I play when I play role-playing games online, I don't use the virtual tabletops and all this kind of stuff. At best, I'm going to use something like Zoom. This is a perfect game for that. We don't need measurements and tiles and miniatures and all this stuff for this game. You can use them, but it's not needed as written. Uh, in fact, I've played Tunnels and Trolls over the telephone. Absolutely love it. Didn't lose one bit of the game by playing it over the telephone. Uh, so it's just that style of game. Uh, so I think that's pretty much going to wrap up our first episode here. We have a lot more to talk about these rules. In fact, before we go, I wanted to mention uh, one big aspect I found out about this game as I played. That there is no game easier to game master whatsoever. Hands down, period. With the game, uh, the way monster ratings and stuff work in this game. We'll see that later, more detailed. But you can literally pull anything spontaneously on the fly out of your imagination and throw it directly into the game. If you're a solo player or a game master, uh, that's something that should get your attention here. I don't care if you pull it from a book, a novel, a movie, uh, using any material written for any fantasy tabletop role-playing game, any campaign setting, any adventure module, etc. You're going to be able to use those basically on the fly with this game with no prep work needed. <laughs> what more do I got to say? <laughs> Anyways, uh, like I said, the next episode here, we're going to be taking a look at a lot of the products that were made available for this game. At least the ones in my collection. Okay? Uh, I have a modest players collection, so don't get too excited. And I'll be able to show you things that I really just loved and other things I say these are essential and stuff. And then we'll be going into these rules and putting them all together and looking at some, possibly doing some solo play with this. Definitely in the future, you're going to be seeing this game pop up on my table for some playthroughs. Uh, anyways, are we to the end yet? Did I remember everything? I don't know. We do this, we do this uh, shooting from the hip, guys. I don't write a script for this stuff. It, you're literally just getting this from my heart and from my mind at the time. Uh, anyways, I'm DevStalker5, and this has been the Random Encounter Show. 
Let's see. Let's add something snappy at the end. Life is only a game if you're willing to roll the dice. Out of here. Hey, this is Dev Stalker 5. I wanted to thank you for watching the Random Encounter Show. If you love tabletop gaming, solo RPGing, or classic video games, make sure you're subscribed to our channel. If you want more of the show, head over to our channel's About page. There you will find our Facebook and Facebook group pages where you can join in on the fun. Want to help support the show? Make sure to use our affiliate and sponsor links next time you're shopping for your favorite gaming products. Anyways, I'll see you guys next time when we roll for Random Encounter.